Well, as Parnell mentioned, one of the things I do is polling. So when we can get the next slide up, we're just going to take a, a simple poll. Um, it's an um, analogue form of polling called a show of hands. Um, so, and let's hope this digital thing... Um, ah, there we go. So, just a show of hands. Now, it doesn't matter whether you've seen the book or the movie, or rather read the book or seen the movie. Uh, hands up those who've read or seen The Fountainhead. Okay, 1984. Oh, he's doing well, isn't he? Wouldn't mind those royalties. Uh, Wealth of Nations. Hmm, that's interesting. You, sh you sure? Do you know how many pages The Wealth of Nations is? Uh, Road to Serfdom. Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, this slide was left intentionally blank because I didn't want to prejudge what you were going to, uh, to decide. Um, I figured that uh, Wealth of Nations would be quite underread, but apparently it's um, fairly well read. Um, I thought that um, um, The Fountainhead would have done better than it did, um, but I'm not surprised at uh, 1984. The point of that, uh, of that was to demonstrate that the things that stick in our mind are the things which make an emotional connection with us, and they're stories rather than facts. The people that will come to a conference like this on a Saturday and a Sunday and retain more than maybe 5 or 10% of it is perhaps that large a percentage um, of the world. Maybe not even that large a percentage of the world. If you're going to persuade people, you're never going to persuade them with facts. You have to persuade them with stories. And I think this man made a gigantic mistake. Who would I be to tell Rupert that he's made a mistake? But I think he made a gigantic mistake if his aim was to change the world when he chose to go with the newspapers rather than 20th Century Fox. Because I reckon 20th Century Fox has done more to shape the 20th century and the 21st than all the newspapers put together. And that's talking as a political professional who's tried to get in the newspapers as much as possible and often seen superior newspaper coverage lose to a, a superior story on the other side. And I think one of the examples that we've seen in that, one of the biggest shiftings of the open and window during my lifetime has been gay marriage or same-sex marriage or whatever it's safe to call it today. And I haven't given you um, polling figures there for every year because they're all from different sources and it's all a bit inconsistent. But you can see that basically back in 1989, no one thought it was a good idea, including probably a lot of people in same-sex marriages. By the time you get down to 2018, about two-thirds of people think it's a good idea. What's happened in the meantime? Well, on the right I've listed, uh, 10 I think it is, uh, TV shows or other things which featured favourable portrayals of gay couples, sometimes raising kids, sometimes not. I'd suggest to you that that did more to change that window than anything else. So if we want to be in the business of changing people's minds, we need to get out of places like this, we need to come to places like this, we need to get out of places like this, and we need to apply what we've learnt artistically. Um, this is an image I'm borrowing from Jonathan Haidt, um, who um, some of you might have heard of Heterodox Academy, some of you might have heard of the book he wrote called The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Disagree on Religion and Politics. Um, he puts the argument, which again most marketers have known forever, that people make an emotional decision first, and then the intellect kicks into gear to justify why they made that decision. If you try and argue with them why they should make a decision, they'll revert to the elephant, which is the emotions. The intellect is the rider on the top. So the rider can, to a certain extent, guide the elephant, but the rider is definitely not in charge of the elephant when it gets a really strong signal. And that's what you've got to work with when you're trying to persuade people. There's problems um, when it comes to persuading people, um, largely to do with how the intellect uh, interacts with your emotions. The first one is that IQ doesn't necessarily correspond with people being right. I think it was um, the aforementioned um, um, George Orwell who said uh, only someone as intelligent as you could believe something as stupid as that. <laughs> because what we understand about intelligence is that we're very good at justifying things to ourselves and if we're a highly intelligent person we're even better at justifying things to ourselves than other people and that means we can keep things up in the air long after they've run out of puff. Uh, for example on climate change 
Uh, what surprised a lot of the people doing research is that they found a lot of highly intelligent people are sceptics of climate change. And a lot of highly intelligent people are uh, cheerleaders for uh, the warmest case. What's happening in both cases, and I happen to be on the sceptical side, so don't let anyone come around and slap me around the head afterwards, but what's basically happening is that people are arguing themselves into positions and then they're defending those positions really strongly and successfully. And that's the second point there. Uh, it's what's called motivated reasoning. If I believe something, I'm more likely than not to want to keep believing it. You know, it's the, that's part of the emotion. You don't want to admit that you're wrong. So you want to keep believing it and therefore you'll reason in a way which allows you to keep believing it. And if you want to persuade someone, don't get in the way of that sort of force. Uh, the second, uh, the third point there is what's called cognitive dissonance. Now, if I say to you that the Earth's flat, there's a couple of things that happen. One is you say, well, that couldn't possibly be right. You know, I just flew here over the North Pole from New York. How could that happen on a flat Earth? The second thing that happens is you say, Graham Young is complete effing idiot. Now, if you're trying to persuade someone, you've got two cardinal errors there. One, you've told them something they know isn't correct. The next, and the other thing you've done is debase the currency of your own argument and your own credibility. Uh, cognitive dissonance uh, exists over a whole wide range of issues, small and great. And if you're trying to win an election campaign or some sort of political campaign, you don't go in there and try and change someone's mind directly. You try and find something where the cognitive dissonance works in your way, where you already agree on it, but it'll get you round to where you want to get by another path. So you're not trying to go over the top of a mountain, you're finding a nice little valley and going around the mountain. Uh, group polarisation is another effect, and um, I first came about across this when I was setting up online opinion. And online opinion, it's now fashionable 20 years after I set it up, to talk about diversity. Uh, but 20 years ago I thought that we were actually putting ourselves in silos and that we needed a space that was open where people could come with all views, whether they're socialists or statists or, or libertarians, um, and argue and that there might be some change in minds through that engagement. Now, I think online opinion has actually been a great failure in that sense. Uh, people don't engage in those sorts of environments and change their minds much. Um, but we set it up partly to deal with this thing called group polarisation, which means that people in groups who already believe something after they've discussed it, believe it even more strongly. Even if they're seven judges of the High Court of Australia, highly intelligent people, if they are predisposed to believe something when they start talking about it, they'll be even more in that direction when they're finished. So we're often not dealing with individuals, we're dealing with groups. And those silos actually increase <coughs> the agreement on those propositions in those groups. So that's another problem that you've got to deal with, uh, and it's probably more... Uh, difficult than some of the other things I've pinpointed. Uh, modes of learning is another issue. I always use PowerPoints, or I try to, uh, because not everyone takes things in through their ears. Uh, in fact, most of us don't. Um, most of us learn best through a combination of methods. Um, so you hear something, then you can try and go and do it or argue, and that'll imprint it in much more clearly. But the thought that you can just sit down with someone and have a conversation and change their mind is frankly lunatic. Um, the last thing I've got up there is memes. Um, it's a dirty game out there, um, and you shouldn't be uh, uh, embarrassed about being less than pure. Um, we've had a GST now since, uh, when was it, 2000 and, uh, no, about 2000. Um, we've had lots of jobs in the meantime. Yet Paul Keating won the 1993 election, and I know a lot of you weren't around then, but I was learning this business back then. He won it mostly on this slogan, jobs, not GST. And that's what they call a meme. It's like the chemicals they use to stop you having headaches or getting pregnant or whatever. Uh, they take these uh, drugs or molecules that are similar to another molecule, which if it gets into the system blocks the other molecule. That's what a meme is. And the other side are using memes all the time. We need to use our own memes. Because if you can't reduce it to a three-word slogan, Malcolm Turnbull, you won't win the argument. Why is Bill Shorten ahead of Malcolm? Because he uses three-word slogans and he uses memes. It's an important tool even if you feel a little bit dirty when you use it. Um, the other, a couple of other things to bear in mind is that 
People are motivated more by fear than anything else. That's an evolutionary trait. Um, it's not the uh, beasts that might be on the other side of the hill um, that are going to help you to survive. It's, about, it's avoiding the lion that's on your side of the creek. So fear, knowing about bad things, is more important to you. It makes it really easy to run fear campaigns like if we don't do something about this CO2, the sky's going to fall in. Uh, but that's just a fact of life, and there's no point arguing with facts of life. You know, we're empiricists, I hope, in this room, so you do what's empirically smart. So if fear works, use it. The other thing that works, um, and um, these two images are from uh, financial tip sheets that end up in my email all the time, and you know these guys are making money, so they must be using techniques that work. Greed is another thing that um, drives people. It's not as strong as fear. Uh, you need a, a lot of potential upside to overcome a little bit of fear. It's still a strong motivator. So when you're trying to persuade people, you know, if you don't do this, something bad will happen to you. If you do do this, look at how much you're going to get. Um, I've got uh, only a few minutes left. Um, I think out of this slide, the most important thing to talk about is framing. If the debate comes in the wrong frame, you're out of it to start with. I don't know how many of you did schoolboy or schoolgirl debating, but we used to spend an inordinate amount of time trying, especially if we're the positive team, trying to novel the other team by coming up with a definition that meant we had to win. Well, it doesn't just happen at school. Uh, and going again back to the, uh, the same-sex marriage, I think once love is love got accepted as a slogan, the people arguing against it were framed out. So you need to get in early on issues. You need to look ahead. You need to say, look, we've lost this one. Just let it go. Where's the next battle? How do we frame that so that the other guys aren't in the debate? And use all these other tools to work those things out because then you're actually working with them rather than against them. Which is my last point. If you're smart, you can get that elephant, the emotions, working in your way to do things to build the sort of better world that we're all spending this two days on a weekend learning ideas and tips about. But you've got to go out there, you've got to put it into practice and you've got to make an emotional connection with people. And if I go back to my first point, if any of you out there are budding writers, filmmakers, songwriters, you're the guys we need more than the people up here telling you the dot points and doing the training. Thanks very much. Thanks, Graham. Um, so our next speaker is Anna Kuma. Anna has worked for 15 years in the US and Australian political campaigns as a communications advisor and campaign manager. She's a graduate of the American University of, from American University in Washington, D.C., and currently works as a consultant at the Sydney-based public affairs firm Statecraft. Yourself. I do have over 15 years of experience in politics in both Australia and America. Did a lot of communications work in the states and more campaign management work here. I'm currently at Statecraft, which is a public affairs firm in Sydney, and I focus on advocacy campaigns, strategic communications, and government relations. Um, so the good news is, is I also have more communications things to talk to you about, but they don't contradict Graham's, which is good because I got a little nervous there. But I think we're all on the same page. <laughs> um, Today I'm going to just quickly talk to you about practical ways to communicate unpopular ideas. Um, and the thing is you can also take out the word unpopular and interchange it with unknown ideas. So I think you communicate those ways and, and those, those ideas in the same way. We'll be discussing three main points. First is knowing your audience. Second is using consistent terminology. And third is how to build a narrative. So knowing your audience. And I'm going to use a lot of context of campaigns itself, just because that's what I know. It's in my blood. Um, but it can be used for policy initiatives. It can be used for ideas. It can be used for grassroots initiatives. It can be used for a lot of different things. I'm just going to be talking about campaigns. So you need to do the initial legwork when you're figuring out who to speak to. And a lot of people will start doing that using research or using polling, like Graham does. 
Um, and I'm not here to say that Graham's not needed because I think he is, but I am here to say that practically, you don't always have at the beginning of a campaign, you can't always have like 50 grand to go do all this beautiful polling that you get to go in the cross tabs and love and hang out and, and dive into, which is a lot of fun. But unfortunately, especially in the world of um, grassroots campaigning, not always a possibility. But you don't need that to get started. You can definitely get started on your own. You can, you have to have a think, you have to sit down and you say, okay, where are we? Like, what are we doing? Who do we need to target? So the first bit you need to do is you say, you know, who's already with you? Who are the people that are on board, that are supporters, that are your friends, that'll hang out with you? You need to look at them and you need to say, okay, you know, what do they like? What are they doing? What types of people are they? And then you take those people and you set them to the side because you don't really want to talk to them that much. You need to talk to them a little bit because they're your supporters and you need to keep them on side. You need to keep them informed. They're also your advocates. That's not who you're talking to. Then the next thing you need to do is you say, who will never be with you? Who will not be your friend? Who will not hang out at lunch break? And those are the people that think of um, environmentalists and mining, right? They're never gonna hang out with you. So what you do with those people, you take them and you set them to the side and you don't talk to them. And this is very hard to do, it's very easy to say and very hard to do. You do not wanna talk to those people. Um, you need to have responses for their attacks because they will be attacking you and you need to answer those attacks sometimes, but you do not need to craft their ideas and their, and their philosophies into your talking points because you're not talking to them and you're never going to talk to them and you're never going to win them over. Um, it's really hard to do because we're, you know, live in this world of knock on every door, you know, don't stop until 6 p.m. on polling day, like go talk to everyone, every vote counts. And that's true, but it's also true that there's a finite amount of time and resources in campaigns, um, and you need to <coughs> use it wisely. And then, so after you figure it out, like, who you like, who doesn't like you, then you say, who do we actually need to influence? Who are the people that are um, on your side, are you know sympathetic to your cause, but maybe don't know it, maybe aren't all the way there yet, and that's who you need to focus on. So you need, to use your, you need to use the language that resonates with them. You need to use um, influencers and advocates and um, surrogates that would influence those people. That's who you focus your campaign around. Do they read the newspaper? Do they listen to radio? Where should you be placing your ads? Where are they low kids online? You need to focus on those people. My next slide is um, using consistent terminology. So the problem with unknown ideas or unpopular ideas is they're not actually spoken about very much because people don't know them and don't know to talk about it. Which means you're kind of starting with a slate or a blank slate and you need to say, okay, how are we talking about this? The ATA is actually running a really great campaign right now called Legalized Vaping. Um, and vaping is actually very pertinent to this conversation because all of these words up here all mean the exact <coughs> same thing. And they're all used in the debate often. Um, I won't read them because I think you can all read. But we, um, with the ATA, they use vaping because their campaign's called Legalize Vaping. But you need to make the decision of going back to that audience of who you're talking to, who are the people that you want to influence, um, which words are pertinent to them, which ones work with them, which ones resonate with them. And that's how you need to decide on your language. If you're targeting young inner city hipsters or truckies, you might not be using, you know, really onerous acronyms that have a lot to do with medical professions. Just have that conversation, have that thought. People aren't, um, people don't know about what you're talking about anyways a lot of the time. And so if you're using a lot of different terms, it's gonna dilute your message. It's not gonna help you get through because you just have to keep hitting it and hitting it and hitting it and keep knocking on these people's heads to try to get it through. You need to be using the same terms so it kind of sleeps through. And this is the last bit, which is also what Graham was speaking about. Good thing. Um, it's really important that we build a narrative. And this is the thing that we don't, we're not great at. Um, our side of politics isn't great at it. Australian politics is not so great at it. I'm sure lots of other people are not great at it as well. Um, it doesn't do any good to say what you want to happen, right? You can't just say legalize vaping or build a bridge or build a tunnel. And that's fine, and people might understand or they might not, but they definitely won't care. So the first thing you need to do is you need to define what is the problem. You need to say, for example,
for smoking, right? We'll just keep using this because I'm sure a lot of you've been watching the campaign. Um, and it's, it's a good example in general. You say, you know, smoking rates have stopped decreasing. The people who are addicted to smoking are seriously addicted. They can't get off of it. It's hurting their health. It's hurting the system. It's hurting Australians, everyday Australians. So you have to build that narrative to say what the problem is. And then you can say, but I have a way to fix it. And then you're a hero, right? Mm -hmm. And so you say, um, this is where all of your, your, all of your work and all of your um, prep has gone into, and this is where you talk about how to fix it. And this is the hard part as well, because you don't want to get too wonky, because you know everything there is to know about this topic, right? You need to keep those messages defined or um, suitable for <coughs> your target audience that you are focusing on. So you keep it top line, you keep it clear, you keep it succinct, you keep it means, and you go through and you deliver your message. And this is the bit, and once again, which Graham was speaking about, that um, we don't do well enough. And it's, why, is it, why does that matter to you? Why do you need to legalize vaping? Why do we need to build a bridge? Why do we need tunnels? Why do we need these things? Um, you need to humanize it, because that's fine, and people might intellectually be interested in it. Chances are they won't be intellectually interested in it, because we're all really busy, and we have a lot of things going on. Um, you need to find some case studies, and that takes a lot of work as well. And you're in these campaigns, and you're doing everything under the sun, and the last thing you want to do is find a case study and find the person that can humanize it. So you have to find them, and then you have to make sure they have a good story, and they probably don't, and then you have to find another person. And then you have to prep that person, and then you have to make sure that person's okay to go in front of TV or to go in front of media. And it's a lot of work, but it's so important because that pulls at the heartstrings, that pulls at the emotion of the issue, and that's what you really need to do. Um, you know, so it's the vapor who can now taste food again, who can go home with their kids and play in the backyard, who can sleep again at night. Um, it's your mom who passed away from smoking-related illness, and if she started vaping 10 years ago, she would be here today. She could, you know, be to your wedding. She could walk or see your kids graduate from high school. All these different things that you need to make it emotive, and you have to make it relate. The one thing about messaging, and this is where it gets um, hard in your brain, it takes, you will be saying the same thing over and over and over again. And you will wake up and you'll write a press release and then you'll be on the phone with someone and you'll be talking about whatever it is and you'll be in the weeds the whole time and you'll be talking about it some more and then you're going to sleep at night and you're having dreams about it and then you write your Facebook post and then you do this and then you do that and that's all you do, right? And you're exhausted and you're bored. You're super bored of it because you know this stuff in and out and surely ever in the whole entire world knows it as well because it's all you've spoken about for 15 months. No one knows about it. They will not know. They will not know and you are gonna have to keep doing it and keep going and you will be bored and you will hate it and you will not wanna proofread another piece of mail or do anything ever again and the public still will not know what you're talking about. So you have to keep that going. You have to keep that momentum up and that push and it's hard and you just wanna take a nap. But sometimes you can't. You just have to keep talking about the thing you've been talking about. Um, another trap we lay for ourselves, we tend to fool ourselves into thinking that if one little sector of society is with us, that everyone is, right? Because these guys get it. So surely everyone else gets it and they're very emblematic of the rest of the public. So you can be on Facebook and you get like really good feedback on Facebook and you're like, oh, I got like a bunch of followers, people are loving my posts, they're shared a ton, like positive feedback, good comments, and you're like, I've done it, I've made it. But you haven't because there's like a million other people you need to go talk to outside of Facebook. And a way to do that, a way to keep this um, perspective with all of it, really, really helpful to have someone who's near the campaign or the initiative, but not in it, right? So it's important to have that person that doesn't, isn't writing the press releases, isn't down there doing the day-to-day -day stuff, um, but is watching a close eye and bounce your ideas off those people. Because then you'll be like, I've got a great idea. We're like gonna go to like Adelaide and we're just gonna talk about like something different because everyone knows about this over here. And then that person can say, sorry, you can't do that. You need to just keep talking about whatever it is. Or just give you some perspective as to how things are actually going in your campaign. Because it's very, very easy to lose perspective when you're literally in it, eating and living and breathing it. 
Um, and so that brings me to the end of my crash course in communications and all the information I've just thrown out at you. Um, to close, we're going to go back to the core messages because that's another good communications principle. Always come back to your core messages. You need to know your audience. You need to build consistent terminology that's relevant to your uh, targeted and identified audience. And you need to build a narrative that will then speak to the emotions of the targets that you are trying to persuade um, over to your side. So thank you very much. And I will turn it back over. Buttons and now I don't know what to do about it. Can't nobody do knows how this works. I might be fine not next up. You've got slides, don't you, Rob? Oh, you don't. In that case, we can just leave that up. Okay, great. Um, okay, our next speaker is John O'Connell. Uh, John joined the TPA, which is the Taxpayers Alliance, as an intern in 2009. Since then, he's worked at every level of, of the organisation um, and then became Chief Executive in August 2016 <laughs> as a researcher and later research director. He wrote major reports for the TPA on mangoes, government capital procurement, regional business policy, and local government pensions. Welcome, John. Thanks, Parnell. Thank you very much for having me. I'm going to break the golden rule about not having anything visual, but I've been travelling for two weeks, so I'm allowed a, a pass on this one, I think. Um, uh, as Parnell said, uh, I'm from the Taxpayers Alliance in the UK. Um, we formed in about 2004. Um, we're coming up to our 15th birthday. Uh, it was a group of disaffected Conservative Party members who, at the time, thought the Conservative Party was siding with Labour on tax and spend issues. So I decided to um, set, set up an advocacy group which um, has grown from strength to strength. And we're now about 15 people uh, in the office with uh, grassroots branches all around the country as well. Um, I'm the chief executive of the organisation, but I also um, took some time off uh, to be a director on the Vote Leave campaign in, in, uh, during the Brexit referendum. Um, and, and on that, just a quick interjection before I go in there, Graham mentioned fear, and, and that's absolutely correct. I would add to that rather than contradict what he said. Um, the Remain campaign based a lot of their campaign on fear. You know, they had Barack Obama, the OECD, Goldman Sachs saying it was going to be an economic disaster um, from the moment that we voted to leave. But actually, our campaign was a bit more optimistic. It was a bit more, you know, embrace free trade, you know, new global partners, you know, other Commonwealth partners like Australia and New Zealand. So in that specific instance, optimism works just as much as fear did um, in other campaigns. So that's to add to what Graham said. So I'm going to quickly talk about two things. I have nothing visual, so I'm going to crack on. One is the um, importance of incremental change, and the second is once you've shifted the Overton window, trying to keep it where you've shifted it to. So on the importance of incremental change, I think um, you know everybody in this room, people who attend conferences like this, have big ideas and want to change the world. All of the books that Graham put up on his slide we've all read and enjoy, and you know we want to make sure that we do what we can to you know push through our big ideas. But I think... Um, to get to where we want to be, we actually have to be realistic and take smaller steps. And I think that's especially true for when a campaign is new or starting up from the ground. Um, for instance, when the TPA started, uh, we, we wanted to look at public sector pay, and in particular senior pay in the public sector. And going through the accounts of uh, local government organisations, quangos, and all the rest of it, um, you couldn't really work out who was paid what, what their names were, what their jobs were. Um, so we start to send freedom of information requests um, to unveil this information and it took years of that pressure for the government to finally say in 2010, right, you're going to have to publish it to the standard that um, the Taxpayers Alliance have um, outlined. So that was the first step. Next step after that, you know, um, the government recently uh, have capped the exit payments, which is basically redundancy payments for public sector staff. So it's those incremental steps getting towards um, uh, an end goal. Uh, we actually called it the Town Hall Rich List. In the UK, we've got the Sunday Times Rich List, where they, you know, uh, what they call the hate list, really, where they call the billionaires and all the rest of it. So we flipped that on uh, onto the public sector and called it the Town Hall Rich List. And it's um, actually taken years to get where we want to be. 
Uh, another example is on our trade union subsidies campaign. So uh, they have facility time in the UK whereby somebody working uh, for a local government, for instance, can take time off to go and work for the trade union while still being paid by the taxpayer. Everybody knew that this happened, kind of just let it slide, but we did some research, exposed it, had a big headline number, £113 million a year. And again, it was that drumbeat, we did it again the year after did it again the year after that, and then the government acted. They issued guidance, and then they said that the cabinet office and other government bodies had to restrict the amount of time that they were given to union officials. So again, it was that incremental step to get towards where we wanted to be. Other things that we do are smaller micro campaigns that are much more consumer-led and have a lot more, lot more of the emotive messaging, you know, on beer duty, fuel duty, um, and issues like that. And we've actually been really successful, particularly on the beer duty campaign, where we've seen uh, initially, a cut in beer duty and, and a freeze uh, ever since. So that's been, again, um, building that narrative that people are overtaxed and it's not just about your income tax and you know people who want to have a pint after work are being punished by the government. Um, to the extent now that actually in the UK, tax is a bad word and it's used by the left just as much as it is by the right. Not that I like the left-right definition necessarily, but for the ease of um, this conversation. Um, the left used tax all of the time and very successfully in the last general election campaign in 2017. Um, the Conservatives recommended a reform to social care policy. The left called it a dementia tax. So, that, uh, you know, um, previous to that, there was a welfare reforms on housing benefit. The left called it um, a bedroom tax. So the left are using it just as much as us. So building that narrative that tax is not necessarily a good thing um, has been quite instructive. Um, secondly, winning is step one. Once you get to where you want to be, um, I think what the free market side, uh, it, for want of a, a better phrase than the right really, is, is that once we achieve that victory, we stop telling the story. We stop saying why it's so good that it's happened. Um, a bad example very much um, occurred in the UK when over the past, over the course of the coalition government, corporation tax it was cut every single year. But they never said why that was a good thing. They never had, you know, Gary the businessman come on TV and talk about why he's able to hire more people for, you know, his growing firm or, you know, invest in new machinery or anything like that. They just sort of, you know, stood up and said, yeah, we're cutting corporation tax, inward investment, and all these other technical phrases. But they didn't actually continue to fight that ground and air war, um, saying why it was a good thing. I think from a campaigning perspective, the opposite actually is happening in the US at the moment. Americans for tax reform are keeping a rolling list of companies that, you know, from Trump's tax cuts, are actually giving people pay rises as a direct consequence of this uh, tax cut, 401k increases uh, and the like. So I think that we've got a lot to learn from a campaigning perspective. Of once you've shifted the other community, you've got to keep handling the message and keep telling the story about why it's good. Because the truth is, if you don't, the vacuum will be filled by the other side. And it very much was uh, in the example I just gave on the corporation tax cut side in the UK. 2017 election, what did Labour say? You know, cutting corporation tax for the bankers while imposing austerity on everyone else. You know, really good story, really good videos off the back of it. And the Conservatives, you know, consequently were punished at the ballot box. Um, all that said, I think um, we do what we can, particularly. Uh, Taxpayers Alliance and other groups like us in the UK, to, um, I think we're punching way above the weight as it happens, considering that most of these organisations that we're up against have significant taxpayer funding that outstrips ours by, you know, uh, untold amounts, not even, even though they say that we're backed by shadowy billionaires and all the rest of it, but you know, again, that's a good story. Um, but we have a big problem, as Graham identified, that actually um, the dominance of the institutions by the left is a huge, huge issue. Charities, academia, uh, the arts, entertainment, filmmaking, music, uh, it's just, you know, the challenge is significant to, so to even achieve what we've achieved is, 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 you know, actually disproportionately quite good, but I think Graham's right, we do need more storytellers, we do need more filmmakers, we need more um, artists to be telling um, people about what we believe in. And Anna mentioned that um, small sectors, you know, when they agree with you, you think, oh, we're onto a good thing here. And often you're not. And I think that's true on our side. Um, again, our side being the free market side, if you will. But um, I think that actually, when, when it's the left doing it, 
actually it's disproportionately powerful because they do have, again, academia or the public health lobby. You know, th these people do not represent the rest of the country at all, you know, but they're still managing to push through sugar taxes, regulations, and all these kind of things. So their small sectors seem to be more powerful than our small sectors because we're representing ordinary uh, citizens and taxpayers. So, um, yeah, the institution dominance is, uh, is you know, the next big challenge, I think, and I think the left have been working with that in the UK since the 60s and have done it very successfully. And they tell better stories than us, and Jeremy Corbyn's campaign in 2017 proved it undoubtedly, and we need to do a lot, lot better next time round. But um, I'll stop there, because I don't have visual aids, and I don't want to bore you, so um, we'll go to Q&A. Or what do you think? Right. Thank you. <laughs> So just to give you a little bit about me, I'm Managing Director of Communications Consultancy Thought Broker. I'm apparently taller than everybody else on the panel. Um, and, and I'm, uh, I'm uh, taking your shoes off. Um, and I'm also a regular contributor to the Daily Telegraph. Uh, I specialise in business and policy communications. And I work with peak bodies and businesses of all sides to shift the needle on public opinion. So what I'm going to talk to you about um, is what the Overton window is, its key arguments, and a couple of things that we can do ourselves to shift the window, as it were. So first of all, you know, just to give you a little bit of a background, and I'm, I'm sure you all know about it, but we do need to sometimes think about the things that we're talking about. The Overton window is a range of ideas which is considered acceptable in public discourse at any given time. And the window moves over time. So for example, where once social norms, such as Graham said, like made accepting homosexuality unthinkable, over time the influence of activists has shifted the window to until not accepting homosexuality is unthinkable to the majority of people in the West. And campaigning and activism move the window further and further until not only is accepting homosexuality popular, but it actually becomes a policy in the form of same-sex marriage. So people invoking the Overton window proposed that this shift is the result of deliberate action and campaigning. But in understanding the Overton window, it's instructive to understand that the idea was initially cooked up by Joe Overton in an attempt to convince donors to keep funding his think tank, the Libertarian Magnat Centre. And after his death, the idea was formalised into the capital O, capital W Overton window concept that his colleague Joseph Lehman in an homage that also <coughs> led the idea a sort of a certain gravitas. After all, now it had a name, and if it was a thing, it had capitals. And it's been very enthusiastically embraced by think tanks everywhere, because it does a great job at justifying their existence. <laughs> the reason it's important to understand these origins is because it explains why the idea focuses on standing on the outside and pulling the window along. Libertarianism is usually somewhere on the, over here on the spectrum, on the unthinkable side, and the think tankers like to feel that they're making a big difference, not just fiddling at the margins. So the idea that you have to stand outside and pull, like this little guy, is clearly a product of the circumstances of the idea's fathers, and not necessarily the actual mechanism by which public perception has changed. It's not to say... I don't like the grand idea of leading people around by the nose. The puppet master model was dramatised by Glenn Beck in his 2010 novel, The Overton Window. And in his narrative, a very clever PR man deliberately pushes the window of the acceptable on behalf of the ruling class until the American people is willing to shred the Constitution. Glenn Beck is convinced that people can be persuaded to do the most unreasonable things, such as pay for tap water by powerful manipulators. In fact, Beck's nefarious PR has exactly that on his CV. Early in the novel, he announces his plan to bamboozle the American people to, the, to his government clients, who at this stage are still incredulous. Mr Gardner asks an attendant bureaucrat, what about the public? What about them? Our diabolical PR answers. The public has lost their courage to believe. They've given up their ability to think. 
They can no longer even form opinions. They absorb their opinions, sitting slack-jawed in front of their televisions. Their thoughts are manufactured by people like me. Gosh, I wish that was true. What about the public, he continues. 20 years ago in this room, I showed a small group of short-sighted businessmen on the face of... Uh, uh, short-sighted businessmen how to sell the public on the most abundant substance on the face of the earth at 10 times the price of premium gasoline. The very same water that flows from their own kitchen faucets for one-tenth of a penny per gallon. That would seem unbelievable. It defies all logic and reason. Your grandparents would have called it larceny, fraud or wanton thievery. And rightly so, I might add. <clears throat> but that experience proved one thing to me. There's a double-edged sword by which the public can be sold anything. From a $3 bottle of tap water to a full-scale war. You see... For Beck, the water thing is an example of people acting zombie-like against their own basic interests. If they can be persuaded to buy water, he reasons, then they can be persuaded to do all kinds of crazy shit. And this is where Beck's vision of the world, and indeed the popular vision of the Overton window, is wrong. Because buying bottled water is not irrational. That is, I see the volume as a value proposition that a bottle of water represents. It's less sloppy, isn't it? I don't buy water. I buy packaging. The refrigeration and the timing. Oh, God. And this slide animation is a bit of a nuisance. Hang on, let's get it. <laughs> I think somebody got carried away late at night. It may have been me. Um, <laughs> oh, see, it doesn't splash you like that. Mid sip. Every bottle of water I save, I buy, saves me schlepping around a container and allows me to travel lighter. And it's cold on a hot day. There's value in the water that goes beyond the faucet. The point is that if, to understand how people's ideas shift, it's crucial not to view them as sheeple. They have their reasons. The key is to try and understand those reasons. You have to understand the value of the offering they're choosing even if you look down on that value. It might be meaningless to you, but it's worth something to them. So turning now to the current moment in history and the various moments that are claiming to shift the over to window. Because success has many fathers, and Trump's success has as many fathers as Becky from the Box Baby on Jerry Springer. So while there are plenty of explanations for how Trump tapped into the discontent of the American working class, or how Hillary was just a lousy candidate and people couldn't bring themselves to perpetuate the establishment she'd come to stand for, there are also plenty of people willing to stand up and say that they don't, that they had a scouring role in the Trump phenomenon. And one in particular who's made a paternity claim on Trump in print is Milo Yiannopoulos. In Dangerous Faggot Milo, or more probably his ghostwriter, writes that by focusing attention on provocateurs like me, it gives breathing space for everyone else to develop their arguments and present them to the public without censure. After an encounter with a force of pure irreverence like me, a George Will column must seem a nice break. That's the Overton window phenomenon in a nutshell. Pushing things out to the extreme, making everything seem milder. Which is, Milo says, the whole fucking point. <laughs> he believes that conservatism needs its great thinkers and its brilliant minds to persuade voters who are already open-minded, but we also need provocateurs and clowns to grab the attention and challenge the biases of those who do not want to be challenged. Well, it's a nice theory, and I, what I like a lot. Essentially, Milo's saying that there's a vanguard in every movement in every movement, which selflessly charges the enemy, copping the brunt of the counter-attack so that the remaining army may advance. Trouble is, I don't believe it. Because if Milo is our cannon fodder, then Kathy Griffin is his equivalent on the left. And my observation is that Kathy Griffin has challenged precisely zero biases. She's a provocateur, and she's a clown. But focusing attention on her hasn't weakened the pro-Trump movement. 
It's driven more people into its arms. This is Glenn Beck again, who used to be never Trump, and recently donned a MAGA hat and declared himself a Trumpkin because of the hysterics of the left. Ironic, isn't it, that the same guy who literally wrote the book on the sneaky forces shifting the Overton window to statism has been shifted to the right by the most very unsubtle forces of Kathy Griffin. Because just naming an idea does not go any way to persuading people of it. And yelling it more loudly or offensively just turns people off more thoroughly. Because what do we call this behaviour from Democrats? That's right. Trump derangement syndrome. <laughs> so provocateurs and clowns tell each side what they want to hear and make everyone more insular. They don't shift the Overton window, they just can't see the light anymore, since they shut themselves in dark rooms surrounded only by like-minded people. I mean, we all live in bubbles, but you just mustn't fool yourself that your bubble is the world. And in the meantime, the actual shift is happening. It continues in ha to happen in pubs and at barbecues, in social fora, and around the kitchen table. The real shift in attitudes comes from positive interactions. Which means there's hope for us who are trying to make an impact. But unfortunately, like all the hardest things, if you hope to change others, the biggest challenge is to start by changing yourself. Sounds a bit Gandhi. It's not. Bear with me. First, the bad news. Around 70% of people won't change their mind. But that leaves the good news. 30% of the time you can get people to change their minds. But in order to change the changeable minds, you've got to change your approach. How? Let's have a look at some research on persuasion dynamics by researchers at Cornell University. People are more likely to be persuaded by the first well-constructed argument they hear. So I've really done myself a disservice by going last. <laughs> Cornell found that in an online argument, the first two challenges to the original post were three times more likely to succeed in changing the original poster's mind than the tenth. So if you want to change people's minds, get in quick, stop talking about it, start doing it. The next thing they found is that while some engagement signals that your opponent is interested, too much engagement can, in, can indicate futile insistence. In fact, after you've badgered them through five rounds of back and forth in an online discussion, you've basically got zero chance of changing your opponent's mind. So don't dig in for the long haul. And as right about messaging, if you're trying in a personal capacity, that is, let me just qualify that. <laughs> Don't dig in for a long haul in that sort of in that environment. Think about how you can improve your argument and try again later. Now, one argument that's also been raised in the current environment is that more people speaking out is emboldening others to shift their position. But Cornell found out that a couple of voices arguing against a single person wasn't more persuasive. In fact, it had the reverse effect. The more people who badger the single person they're trying to change the mind of, the less likely that person was to change the mind. So don't pile on. It's counterproductive. Also, they found out that how you express yourself is key. Who knew? Um, it'll come as no surprise to you that if you get into an emotional argument, you're less likely to change your mind or have your own mind changed for that matter. So if you go in angry, you'll just make people angry. So try to argue calmly. The more you want to succeed, the more you should work to contain your emotions. And perhaps, unsurprisingly, the more you practice persuading people calmly, the better you get at it. So does that mean no more baiting and teasing and no more trolling just because it's fun? Should you give up the things that amuse you? <laughs> no! <laughs> but just don't kid yourself that you're shifting the Overton window when you're doing it. 
Don't forget to stop yelling sometimes for long enough to engage. Argue calmly and engage with people in a rational way. Who knows? You just might find that you can change your mind. And remember that, as Burke said, all it takes for evil to win is for good men to do nothing. So don't do nothing about poor arguments. Don't yell and scream. Go out there and calmly, rationally change minds.